but we want to bring to your attention what happened just yesterday in Egypt. The new government there began to take shape. Military leaders swore in new cabinet members. Anyone tied to the Husni Mubarak regime is now officially gone. But will these new changes be enough to satisfy the public? Joining us on the phone is Shadi Hamid. He's director of the Brookings Doha Center. He joins us live from Doha in Qatar by phone. Uh, good evening, I guess, locally to you there, Shadi. Uh, tell me about this change in Egypt, these new government ministers being sworn in. How would you gauge the pro progress that's been made since Mubarak stepped down? Sure. Well, this is a big step. First of all, this is the first time a member of the opposition has been prime minister in Egypt for more than six decades. So that by itself is an important development. And as you mentioned, many of those with ties to the old regime have been forced out, and we have new faces. Uh, what's also interesting is a new foreign minister, and that's something that might get more attention in the U.S. He's someone who sees Egypt playing a more independent role. He's criticized Israel in the past about and talking about holding Israel accountable and talking about an unacceptable policy on the Gaza border. So this is that, I mean, so these are signs that the new cabinet is going to take on a different orientation. And we're talking about ministers who have a different vision for the country. And this was a major demand of the protesters. And they specifically mentioned um, Assam, Assam Sharaf, uh, the new prime minister, as one of the people they wanted to see. So the fact that the military accepted that and listened to them is a sign that the military is really trying to meet the protesters halfway and that it is listening. Uh, sounds like you're seeing this as a hopeful sign. Meantime, there have been a number of pictures, video, worries about some of these secret documents that have resurfaced now as the, the secret police have tried to hide, it seems like, some of the evidence that they held uh, on their books of, of past torture, of past information that they had garnered from Egyptians. Well, the secret police is one of the most hated symbols of the old regime, and that's why protesters were trying to storm uh, buildings that belonged to them. They were worried that some of these documents showing these crimes and providing evidence of them would be destroyed, and therefore people wouldn't be held accountable. Um, but it seems that the public prosecutor in Egypt is trying to move more aggressively to try people who are responsible for financial and other crimes. There's still a long way to go, and this is these are just some initial demands. The protesters want more, mm -hmm. and we're going to have to wait and see. It's not going to happen overnight, but this is a long process, and perhaps this is a, a good first step. Yeah, we'll, we'll track the progress, particularly those who have ties to the business community and to the former government. The market's still not open in Egypt. But I want to talk about now what's happening on one of Egypt's borders. That is what's happening next door in Libya. Um, is there a danger in the amount of people spilling over from Libya who are trying to flee some of the brutality that's been reported as being carried out by the Qaddafi regime? Sure. What happens in Libya doesn't just affect Libya. We're talking about a humanitarian uh, catastrophe along the border where you have tens of thousands of people uh, spilling out on the Tunisian border. It could potentially get worse. If this really becomes a protracted civil war that lasts for months, we're going to see more and more displacement of civilians. And that's why, really, you know, this is a time for the international community to think seriously about what the options are. And that's where we get into a whole debate about humanitarian intervention. Yeah, and, and we do know NATO meeting later this week. The price tag put on a no-fly zone uh, by one of our reporters, Lizzie O'Leary, as being between 2 to $3 billion a year. Are you hopeful that one will be instituted? I think now is the time for decisive action. The Libyan rebels themselves have been very clear. They have called time and time again for a no-fly zone. So for people who say that Arabs don't want Western intervention, the rebels are saying otherwise, that they can't win, they can't defeat Gaddafi unless they have help. Because in the end, they don't have an air force. They're right. just doing this with a hodgepodge of militias. They don't have the right equipment and firepower. That said, there is talk about a potential deal between the rebels and Gaddafi where they're giving him 72 hours 
to uh, to give up power. So we're going to have to see if there's a positive response there. If there isn't, then again, we're going to have to return to this issue of a no-fly zone. All right, Shadi, thank you very much for calling in. Always good to talk to you.